in lecture 17, we started with an overall reaction of A goes to B. And one of the things that we learned was that reactions aren't simple one-step processes, not generally, and especially not when we're talking about heterogeneous catalysis. And so what we did was we broke this up into three reactions, right? The first one was an adsorption reaction where our reactant A reacts with a free site and that gave us an adsorbed molecule of A on the surface, right? With some reaction rate constant Ka for that specific process. And then of course, then we have an equilibrium value because we're writing this as a reversible reaction. And one of the things that we were able to do then was we develop rate laws for these processes. And so the rate of reaction one is simply then minus Ka times Ca times the concentration of vacant sites that were on the surface plus Ka over Ka times the concentration of A on the surface, right? Which could go back and desorb. And another way that we could write this is just the rate of reaction one is equal to minus Ka times CACV minus CAS over Ka, right? So there's the rate of reaction one. The second step in our mechanism here is the reaction of the adsorbed A to give us an adsorbed B. And we said that that had a reaction rate constant Ks and an equilibrium constant of capital Ks. And we also developed a rate law for this. So we have the rate of reaction two is then equal to minus Ks times the concentration of A on the surface plus Ks over its equilibrium constant times the concentration of B on the surface. And of course, we also could write this slightly different and just say that's minus Ks times Cas minus Cbs over the equilibrium constant, right? And so we have the first reaction is adsorption, then the surface reaction. We have rate loss for each of those. And the final step in this overall process was then the desorption of B, where this adsorbed B comes off the surface with a rate constant Kb and an equilibrium constant of capital Kb to give us B. And we get the site back when we, when we have a desorption. And of course, then the rate of that reaction is then equal to minus Kb times the concentration of B adsorbed on the surface plus Kb over the equilibrium constant times the concentration of B times the concentration of vacant sites. And we can rewrite this as well as R3 equals minus Kb times C of B dot S minus Cb Cv divided by the equilibrium constant Kb, okay? Now, one of the things that we wanna understand in our lecture today is how the, as the mechanism proceeds, what would happen if each one of these steps was the rate determining step? And essentially what a rate determining step is, is the step in an overall mechanism because each step has its own rate constant. It's essentially the step with the highest activation energy, right? It's the highest energy barrier, which almost always means that the actual rate constant itself is the lowest. So what we wanna do today is understand, depending on which one of these steps is the rate determining step, what would the rate law look like? And then how could we use experimental data to determine which is correct or which mechanism is correct after we assume a rate determining step? Now, just because I say that it has the highest activation energy, something to note here is that that does not mean that the rate of that reaction is actually slower. The thing to realize is that in a mechanism, 
all of the steps will occur at the same rate. All of them. So actually, the rate of reaction one equals the rate of reaction two equals the rate of reaction three, which equals R A prime. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. But one of these steps is going to control the behavior. And as I said, that means that the activation energy is going to be higher. So let's say instead of just taking the rate, let's say that we divided by the rate constants, right? So let's say instead here that we looked at the rate of any of the reactions with respect to its equilibrium constant. Well, for the rate determining step um, and the non-rate limiting steps, these are not gonna be equal to each other because if they all happen at the same rate, the rate determining step will have a relatively small value for this. Whereas the value for all of the non-rate determining steps, this ratio is gonna be small. And in fact, it's going to be approximately equal to zero. Okay. And we're gonna use that to our advantage. So what we're going to do today is one at a time, we are going to look at one of these steps as the rate determining step. And then we're gonna derive the rate law using all of the information that we have on the page right now. And then we're gonna talk about what experimental data would look like if we were correct. And then we'll do the next one, and then we'll do the next one. So the first one we're gonna do is adsorption, okay? So let's look at adsorption as the rate determining step, right? And that's this step, of course, right? Step one. And if adsorption is the rate determining step, well, we already said that we know what the rate of the reaction is gonna be. So the rate of the reaction, of course, is going to be equal to um, the rate of, of that step, which we said just a moment ago was minus Ka times Ca times Cv minus Cas over Ka. Now, this would be fine if we actually could measure this. And most of the time, we can't measure it. Not typically, anyway and know what it is in real time. So we're, what we're going to do then is use this relationship to then derive expressions for all of the things that we can't measure and get them in terms of measurable quantities. So let me show you as an example here. So if we're assuming that the rate of the non-rate determining steps divided by their rate constants are equal to zero, well, then we could just look at the rate of reaction two, right? Which is not the rate determining step, at least in, in this discussion, divided by Ks, right? That's approximately equal to zero. And if we go back up here and look at the mechanism, well, R2, which is here, divided by Ks is simply equal to minus Cas plus Cbs, over Ks. And so we can easily then solve for the concentration of Cas, right? That's just equal to Cb on the surface over the equilibrium constant. That's fine, but unfortunately, we also don't measure this one typically. And so then let's utilize our other non-rate determining step expression right? That's approximately equal to zero. And R3 divided by Kb, then if you look at our equation above here, is just minus Cb dot S plus Cb times Cv, the vacant sites, over Kb. And so I can then solve for Cb dot S, right? That equals Cb times CV over KB. And this is good news 
because we actually could measure B, presumably, in the process. And um, that we likely know, or at least we will have an expression for it. And KB, we also can know, right? It's, it's one of the equilibrium constants. So then let's use this above and also get an expression for CAS, right? And that's CBS over KS. So this just becomes CB times CV divided by KS times KB, okay? And now we have a rate law and we have the concentration of these intermediate species as a function of something CB that is presumably measurable or knowable because even if we're just measuring the concentration of A, of course we know A goes to B. So just like we've done the entire semester, you could get the concentration of B from there. So the next step in evaluating the mechanism here, now that we have uh, the rate law, we've made our simplifying assumptions here, is to insert the concentration for CAS into the rate of reaction there. And if we do that, well, then we know that RA is then equal to minus KA times CACV minus CB times CV over KA times KS times KB. Okay. And we actually can simplify this a little bit. And I, I want to show you here that we already know what this is, believe it or not. So if we were to look at this, right, Ka times Ks times Kb, right? So that would be, you know, Ka is just Cas over Ca times Cv. And Ks is just C B dot S over C A dot S. And KB is simply equal to CB times CV over CB dot S, right? And let's look at this for a second, right? The CAS is cancel, the CV is cancel, the CB dot S is cancel. And we get that this is equal to CB over CA, which is just equal to our reaction rate constant KC. And so this simplifies to the reaction rate of A is equal to minus KA times CACV, oops, sorry about that, minus CB times CV over KC. And the last thing that I want to do here is I'm going to pull this thing CV out here. And RA is equal to then minus KA times CV times CA minus CB over KC. And hopefully at this point, this looks sort of familiar. Um, you know, we've had expressions like this before for reversible reactions. The only new thing here is this expression for CV or the number of vacant sites. So let's account for those sites and see if we can get those in terms of measurable things and some of the relationships that we've established already. Well, we said in lecture 17 that the total number of sites is, is just equal to the number of vacant sites plus the number of sites that are occupied by the species involved in the reaction. In this case, that's CA and CB. And we have expressions for those. So that's just CT equals CV plus. And our expression for CAS is CB, CV over KB, KS. And our expression for the concentration of B that's adsorbed is just CB times CV divided by KS. And we can simplify this a little bit and have CT equal to CV, we'll pull that out at each one of these terms, plus then CB over KB times KS, plus CB divided by KS. And we can then solve for CV, which is this thing that we were looking for, and CV equals CT divided by one plus CB 
over KB times KS plus CB over, over KS. And that gives us a rate law, you know, going back to here and inserting CB that RA equals minus KA times the total number of sites times CA minus CB over KC divided by one plus CB over KB times KS plus CB over KS. Okay. And that is our rate law for A, which of course is much more complicated than the ones that we had previously for just the reversible reaction. But it, if you look at it, it takes all of the things that we've been talking about into consideration. So of course, there's the reversibility part, which looks very familiar, the CA minus CB over the reaction rate constant. But now it also accounts for the adsorption of B and, um, or sorry, the adsorption of A and the adsorption of B, okay? So, how might we actually figure out if this rate determining step is correct or if this mechanism is correct, right? Where, where we assumed that the rate determining step was the, first, um, was the first step in the mechanism, which was the adsorption of A. So to figure that out, we need to think about the data that we might wanna collect in this process. And it turns out the smartest thing to think about here is the initial rate. And what would the initial reaction rate look like? Now, one of the really interesting things about right at the beginning of an experiment is that the concentration of B is about zero, right, at the initial rate. And so at the very start of this process, our rate law would simplify pretty considerably. So if we look at this again, where RA is minus KA times CT, now all of a sudden we would have CA zero, right? That would be the very, very beginning of our um, process. Then minus CB zero, which is zero over KC divided by one plus CB again over KBKS and that's zero plus CB over KS, which is also zero. So all these terms end up, well, that one doesn't go away, goes away. And we end up getting something very simple that is minus KA times CT times CA zero. And a lot of times what we're gonna end up doing in this semester is we're just gonna lump this together because this would be the rate constant that we would observe. and this would essentially just be our, um, our reaction Ka. And a lot of times we just call it that, or we'll call it K1 maybe, because that's a little more consistent with what we've done throughout the semester and it doesn't confuse the Ka's. So we end up getting an expression that the rate of reaction of A initially is just equal to minus K1 times Ca0. And the really great thing about this is that we, what we would do experimentally is we would design a series of experiments where we would just plot you know, the initial rate of A versus our initial concentration of A, right? And we would either measure the production of B or we would measure the consumption of A in our experiments. And what should we find here? It should be a perfectly straight line, right? So we would get an expression that looks like that. And if we were able to do this, right, an experiment where we change the initial concentration, we measured the initial rates, and you plot them and that's a straight line, that would mean that the adsorption was the rate determining step. Okay. Now, before I go on to the second case, I just want to open it up to you guys to ask a question about any of the things that we've done so far.
Could you maybe explain one more time why like the ratio between like R1 and, and K is approximately zero? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so if we go above here, so the assumption that we're making here is that you know, overall, the values of K are relatively, um, are going to be relatively large for the step that's not the rate determining step. And so if they're all the same, right, if all the RIs are same because the reaction happens at the same rate, you're just going to have one of these ratios that's much, much bigger than the other ones. And so for the non rate determining steps that have the very large reaction rate constants, you're essentially just assuming that that ratio is very small, especially compared to the rate determining step. And if we take that as just much smaller than the rate determining step, we say that that's approximately zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think believing in everything we did after that um, relies on understanding that ratio. So that's a really, really good question. Okay, so then the second step in our transformation of A to B is here, right? Where the actual surface reaction is rate limiting. So that's the second case that we're gonna look at here is where our surface reaction is rate limiting. And we're gonna use all the same tools that we used a second ago for the case where the adsorption of A was rate limiting. So now, of course, you know, the rate of reaction of A is equal to the surface reaction. And we already developed that expression, right? That was minus KS times CAS minus CB dot S over KS. And now since the second reaction is the rate determining step, well then what that means is that R1 over Ka is approximately equal to zero. And it means that R3 over Kb is also approximately equal to zero. And we're gonna use these in exactly the same way that we used them a minute ago for the adsorption step. So let's do the first one. Well, R1 over Ka equals just Ca Cv plus Cas over Ka. And remember the reason that we did this is that we wanted to get the immeasurable quantities in terms of measurable quantities, right? And that's equal to zero. So that means that Cas is equal to Ka times Ca times Cv, okay? And if we do the same thing for reaction three over KB, right, equal to zero, we also have that expression as well, right? That's minus CB dot S plus CB times CV over KB. And so again, we can solve for CB dot S, and that's just CB times CV over KB. So now we have expressions for both CAS and CB dot S. And let's plug those in. So now we have that RA is equal to minus KS times KA CA CV minus CB CV over KS times KB. And one of the things that I can do here is I can pull the CV out again, just like I did last time. And then RA is equal to minus KS times CV times KA CA minus CB over KS times KB. Okay. And just like we did in our previous example, well, we can get an expression for CV. 
where the total number of vacant sites, oops, sorry, the total number of sites is just the vacant sites plus CAS plus CB.S. And so that's equal to CV plus our expression here for KA or for A, sorry, which was KA CACV plus CB CV over KB. And I'm gonna pull the CV out here again, just like I did last time. And that's one plus KA CA plus CB over KB. And finally, we get that CV is equal to CT divided by one plus KA times CA plus CB divided by KB. And we end up then with a rate law with respect to A that is minus KS times the total number of sites times KACA minus CB times KSKB divided by one plus KACA plus CB over KB. And the last simplifying step I'm gonna use here is that we know that KC, our overall reaction rate constant again, is just KA times KB times KS. And I'm gonna to get to that by pulling a KA out of the parentheses in the numerator. And um, what we can get to here then is that RA equals minus KS times KA times the total number of sites times CA minus CB over KC divided by one plus KA times CA plus CB over KB. And there is our rate law for when the surface reaction is the rate determining step. And again, we're gonna ask the question about how would we know if this was correct? And again, we're gonna look at the initial rate again, okay? And just like we did a moment ago, when, our, when we have the initial rate, right? CA is just CA zero and CB is essentially zero. And maybe at the initial rate, we'll say it's perfectly equal to zero. And so if we start to explore the rate law again, then we would get that RA is equal to, right? Minus KS times KA times CT times CA zero minus, then CB over KC is just zero. And then that's divided by one plus KA times CA plus zero because CB zero is zero. Right, and sorry, that's CA zero. And so then initially, right, then RA would just be minus KS times KA times CT times CA zero over one plus KA times CA zero, okay? And again, we can group these three terms here and just call those K1. And so then RA is just equal to minus K1 times CA zero over one plus Ka times Ca zero. And then we can ask ourselves, well, what is this gonna look like? And there's really two cases I think to consider. The first one is when Ca zero is very, very small, right? If we have very, very uh, low values for Ca zero. Well, when, when Ca zero is small, then essentially what's gonna happen is that that term is essentially negligible compared to one, right? When CA zero gets very, very small. And so what we would find is that when CA zero is small, we're just gonna have a straight line like we did last time. But what happens when CA zero is large? Well, what's gonna happen then is that the one plus KACA zero is going to be dominated by the KACA zero. 
And then what will happen is that the CA zeros cancel. And so when CA zero gets very large, the initial rate is just going to be constant. And what would that look like if we plotted it? Well, if we plotted minus the initial rate over the concentration or the initial concentration of A, again, like we said, we would have, um, we would have a straight line and then it would plateau to some value here. Now, the, an interesting question would be, what is that value? Well, that value is just K1 over Ka, which again, we called K1 as Ks times Ka times Ct over Ka. So this value here that we level off at is just the surface reaction rate constant times um, the total number of sites. So that's an interesting um, thing here that at the very beginning of our experiments, it behaves very much like adsorption, but at the end, it, it flattens out, okay? All right, is this okay with everybody or does anyone have any questions before we do the final case? I did have a question. Uh, this time when you went from RA to RA naught, where um, you put K1 in. So mm -hmm. is K1 in this case, KS times equilibrium constant for A times CT? Correct. Yep. And was, That's is correct. that the same as part one or is that different? No, because if you if we go back to part one, so that's a good question. So um, this K1 was just the rate of A, right? Ka, that the, the rate of that forward reaction times CT. And so that's a good point to make here that the thing that we measure in K um, in the reaction rate constant um, is going to ha mostly have information about the rate determining step, which hopefully makes some sense to you guys, right? That, that this K1 contains Ka if that first step is the rate determining step. And here where we did it, that K1 contains Ks, where in this particular case, we were assuming that that was the rate determining step. Hopefully that makes sense. Good Thank question. You. Yeah, good question. Anybody else have a question they want to ask? Okay. So if that's the case, then let's do our third example for today, where now we're going to assume that the desorption of B is the rate determining step. Okay. And just like we did a second ago, we're gonna use all the same tools, okay? So the first thing, of course, then, is that our rate of reaction is gonna be equal to the rate of reaction three, which is minus KB times CB dot S minus CB times CV over KB, okay? And now in, in this case, because the third reaction is the rate determining step, that means the rate of reaction one over Ka is approximately equal to zero. And the rate of reaction two over Ks is approximately equal to zero. So uh, as we did before, you know, we're just gonna use this to our advantage. So let's do this for reaction one. So reaction one or the rate of one over Ka, which of course we just said is equal to zero is equal to minus Ca times Cv plus CAS over KA. And the thing that we're interested in here is then the concentration of A dot S in terms of the measurable thing, which is CA. So CAS then equals KA times CA times CV. And if now we look at reaction two, over Ks as being equal to zero. Well, we also know then the rate of reaction two is minus Cas plus Cb dot S over Ks. 
And when we solve for the concentration of B on the surface, we get Ks times Cas. And we just found that. So this just becomes Ka times Ks times Ca times Cv. Okay. And now let's implement these in the rate law that we wrote up here. So when we do that, right, Ra is equal to minus Kb times Ca Cv times Ka times Ks minus Cb times Cv over Kb. Okay. And I'm going to use the same relationship that I've used before in that Ka times Ks times Kb is equal to Kc. And I'm also gonna pull the Cv out again. So Ra then equals minus Kb times Cv times Ca times Ka times Ks minus Cb over Kb. And then I'll utilize this next and show that Ra is minus Kb times Cv times Ka Ks times Ca minus Cb over Kc. Okay. And so the only thing that we have really left to do here is find this expression for Cv. And we'll use the exact same methodology that we've used before, where the total number of sites is the number of vacant plus the number of occupied. And that just equals Cv plus, now Ca dot S was Ka times Ca times Cv. And Cb dot S was Ka Ks times Ca Cv. So let's pull the Cv out of each one of those. And Ct then equals Cv times one plus Ka times Ca plus Ka times Ks times Ca, okay? And we get an expression then for Ra, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one step where Ct equals, or Cv equals Ct over then one plus Ka, Ca plus Ka, Ks times Cv. So then our, our Ra then equals minus Kb times Ct times Ka Ks times Ca minus Cb over Kc divided by one plus Ka Ca plus Ka times Ks times Ca. Okay. And here's our rate law when the desorption is the rate determining step, okay? So how would we go about determining whether this was correct? And again, we're gonna use our initial rate data where we know that CA is CA zero and that CB is equal to zero. Now this doesn't do as much for us as it did in our previous examples because CB essentially only is present one time. And so we end up with this expression for the initial rate as, you know, RA0 is equal to minus KB times CT times KAKS times CA0 divided by one plus KA CA0 plus KA times KS times CA0, okay? And to ask what this would look like when plotted is difficult, right, for us to do. But let's ask ourselves physically, what would happen when desorption dominates, right? We have this step where, you know, A comes to the surface and adsorbs, and then B, is formed and then 
the whole process is kind of shut down. And so when that's the case, we would expect the surface concentrations of A and B to be really, really high. And what does that mean for us? Well, it means that Ka should be pretty big. It also means if we are accumulating B on the surface, that that also should be pretty big. And what that means as far as our discussion is that we can pick on the denominator here a little bit. And that would mean that one plus Ka Ca zero plus Ka times Ks times Ca zero. Well, that's approximately then if both Ka and Ks are greater than one, then the one goes away. And then this becomes equal to Ka times Ca times one plus Ks, right? And sorry, that's Ca zero. And we can then plug that in into our expression for RAO, right? Let's say that's approximately then equal to KB times CT times KA, KS, CA zero divided by KA times CA zero times one plus KS, right? Well, the nice thing here is that then these CA zeros are gonna cancel and the KAs are gonna cancel. And we get that that is minus KB times CT times KS over one plus KS. But just a minute ago, we used this fact, right? That KS could be much greater than one because you're accumulating B on the surface. And if that's the case, well, that goes away. And then those cancel. And what we're left with for this desorption limited process is that RA0 should be approximately equal to minus KB times the total number of sites. And that's our reaction rate constant. And that also is constant. And so now if we were to plot the initial rate versus the initial concentration of A, all we should get is a flat line where that value is equal to KB times CT. And hopefully it makes sense that when the desorption of B is the rate determining step that the behavior doesn't depend on the concentration of A because everything's eventually going to lead to the surface being covered with B and we have to wait for it to leave and to free up sites for that reaction to happen. Okay. All right. So does anybody have questions about the third sort of um, derivation here when the desorption was the rate determining step? All right, so if that's the case, here's what I, I wanna talk about a couple of things really quick before we end our class today. The first thing is I want you to realize here how much more complex the rate laws are than what we've seen before. And you know, that's something that hopefully you have an appreciation for and it's something we're gonna deal with as we move on uh, later in the semester. The second thing is that despite the complexity of the rate laws, we're able to determine which step is the rate determining step by making simple measurements, right? Measuring the initial rate versus initial concentration is actually pretty straightforward uh, for most reactions. And so um, you can take what we've learned here and we will expand that to other reactions as well, where you'll see examples where we'll plot the initial rate data versus concentration. And if you see a flat line like you do here, it's still desorption limited, even in a complex mechanism. If it's a straight line, it's still adsorption limited, just like it was in the initial case. And if you have a transition between straight, a straight line and a plateau, it's usually surface reaction limited. And these are things that we're gonna be able to apply. So it's not just 
something that we derive for this one reaction that we're never going to use again. Okay. The last thing that I want to point out, and it's something that we talked about when we were developing rate laws, is that there's a procedure to follow. And it's, it's something that I do every single time. And, you know, here we're going to be looking at, you know, reaction mechanisms for a little while in our class. And so I want to give you sort of the steps for figuring out a reaction mechanism and which one is correct. And so the first thing that you have to do here is you have to postulate a mechanism. And believe it or not, that's exactly what we did at the very beginning of our class today, which is sort of a holdover from lecture 17. This is a postulated mechanism. There are all sorts of things that could be true, like maybe A adsorbs and B um, is only fizzy sorbs, so it's not really bound to the surface at all. So maybe it just comes off. So maybe, um, um, maybe this step would just be B plus S, and there'd be a whole other thing that we would have to do. But this is a postulated mechanism, and all of the reaction pathways that we would look at, you, you would do that. You would have to guess what the mechanism is and then prove yourself correct, or at least prove that the data that you would take would be consistent with a mechanism. Um, because we learn new things all the time in science and engineering, and we disprove mechanisms constantly, even though the previous ones were consistent with a lot of data. The second thing after we have a postulated mechanism is that we have to assume a rate determining step in that mechanism, right? And that's what our lecture today was all about, was within a postulated mechanism, um, assume a rate determining step and then do the following, right? The next thing that we did was write the rate laws, right? For the rate determining step. Then the next thing that we did was we used the non-rate determining step relationships, you know, where the rate of I over KI was approximately equal to zero to find immeasurable quantities in terms of measurable ones. And that was the steps where we found all of the CA dot S's and the CB dot S's, right? That was just our attempt to do this step. And then the next thing that we did was we wrote the site balance. And our site balance was simply that CV equals CT plus the concentration of all the adsorbed intermediates, which in this case was this, but it could be, it could be a number of things, right? And then we found some expression that CV was equal to CT over a bunch of stuff in parentheses. And that's really the site balance. We're accounting for the vacant sites and that allowed us to finally derive the full rate law. And the last thing that we did was we compared experimental data with the expected behavior from our derived rate law.